tension in central Nigeria two weeks after more than 100 were killed in fighting between rival ethnic groups. A military operation is underway in Plateau State to find those who carried out the attacks. We ask how dangerous is the religious and political divide in the country and what solution to this ongoing conflict. This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Nick Clark. For the last decade, Plateau State in central Nigeria has been a hotbed of ethnic tension between the Fulani, who are traditionally Muslim, and the Boromi, who are Christian. Well, last month, more than 100 people were killed in violent clashes between the two. And on Tuesday, thousands of villagers were evacuated from their homes amid fears of more violence. Mohamed Ado has this report. Paul Bearers carry the body of a member of Nigeria's Plateau State Parliament. James Giang Fulani was gunned down along with 40 others two weeks ago. Plateau was once known for its peacefulness, but long-running ethnic tensions between rival tribes have turned it into one of Nigeria's most volatile states. As tension continues to rise, the military has been deployed to stop the conflict. But the state governor is unconvinced the, the military can bring peace. Uh, the military itself is becoming polluted. Uh, they, are become, they are becoming part of the problem instead of solving the problem. Because uh, uh, some of them, as we have found out, do take sides. The security forces generally have to sort out themselves to be able to maintain peace, law and order in the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Jos, the capital of Plateau State, is in the heart of Nigeria's religiously diverse Middle Belt. It's here that the mostly Muslim North meets the largely Christian South. And the region for the past 10 years has been racked by religious and ethnic rivalries over power and land. And just this month alone, more than 100 people were killed as the attacks get more sophisticated and intense. The current conflict is mainly between the Christian Berom families and the Muslim Fulani herdsmen. And the destruction caused by their dispute is quite visible in villages outside Jos. At the Fulani village of Dogo, we met Osman Abdullahi rummaging through the debris of his burned down house. He has just returned to his compound after fleeing to safety with his wife and seven children. It's very sad. We have been forced to seek shelter with some of our relatives. We have been left with nothing. There is a little I can do. I leave this matter to God. A few kilometers away from Dogo, at a village inhabited by the Berom tribe, there have been deadly attacks by Fulani gunmen. You could imagine an attack that security men were around, but they have to run for their life. What more of civilians? So it was horrible. And so the people of Plateau are picking up the pieces once again. And many appear skeptical of the government's plan to bring peace back to their state. Mohamed Ado Al Jazeera, Jos, Nigeria. So we take on this burning issue of religious and political friction in Nigeria. Let's meet our guests. In Boston, Darren Q, the Associate Professor of Conflict Resolution at the University of Massachusetts. He's also the author of an upcoming book called Democracy, Conflict Resolution and Civil Society in Nigeria. In London, we have Michael Amur. He's an Africa analyst and author of Reconstructing the Nation in Africa. And on the phone line from Nigeria in Abadan, we have Isaac Owali Albert. He's a professor of peace and conflict studies at the University of Ibadan. He's also the director of the Institute of African Studies. And welcome, gentlemen, to you all. I'd like to get to the, the very origins of this dispute, of this conflict. Uh, Michael Amur, is it true to say that these troubles have their beginnings in claims over grazing and farming rights by rival ethnic groups, one of which happens to be Muslim and the other Christian? How did it all start? Well, um, part of it is what you just said, that you've got the indigenous Berum, and then you've got the House of Fulani pastoralist tribesmen who are more or less settlers. And I think what we need to clarify is that when the reportage says Fulani Muslims have attacked Berum Christians, it's not exactly accurate. 
because not all Birum are Christian. And also that we need to ascertain the fact that not all, if you're not a Muslim, it doesn't necessarily make you a Christian. So when they say a Berum village or a Christian village in Berum has been attacked, it's not very accurate on the ground because as I've just said, not everyone in a Berum town or village or neighborhood who is not a Muslim is a Christian. Right, so Isaac Albert, uh, there are other issues of ethnicity, there are other issues of territory and of land that are going on. And, and once you light that fuse, uh, the whole problem of uh, religious fault lines come into play as well. Is that what's going on? Well, I think we really need to go back to history uh, to actually reflect on how it all started. Uh, of course, uh, the city of Jos was established around 1915, and that city developed around the economy of tin mining. But uh, in the 60s, tin mining industry collapsed, and the tin industry attracted outside settlers who worked alongside their their own, uh, Anaguta and Abizere, uh, 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 you know, Set the origin, you know, uh, uh, owners of that community. Now, when the when the team uh, economy collapsed, there was that challenge of the house of Fulani settlers, uh, you know, having to move to other economic activities. But I think what we have to take into consideration in this case is that the house of Fulani settlers are dominantly Muslim, whereas the Berum, Avisere, and Anaguta are dominantly Christian. So now you have a, a, a situation in which ethnicity is also interacting with religious chauvinism. So it's a combination of ethnicity and religious Chauvinism. Okay, now, Isaac Albert, hold on uh, a second. So I'm just going to bring in Darren Q here because we've got to spread this around. And, and so we have, th that's a kind of baseline of our problems, Darren. Uh, and over the years, uh, that's sort of the background, the history. And over the years, it's all spiralled now. And I guess exacerbated uh, by politicians from both sides vying for power. Is that right? Yes, I think there's two dimensions to the political aspect of this. One is, as you just mentioned, uh, is that politicians, like anywhere else in the world, have been uh, very apt to use uh, religion and ethnicity for political mobilization purposes. And I think that has exacerbated the crisis over the years along the lines that Professor Albert uh, was indicating. Uh, second is a legal issue known as indigeneity, uh, which is across Nigeria, which basically uh, says that um, local governments, uh, you belong to the local government within which you have some sort of ethnic history. And local ethnic majorities have often used the indigeneity principle to disenfranchise local minorities, uh, preventing them from having particular voting rights or access to state resources, and then, of course, uh, also to use them from getting access to land. And both of these have been used to target minorities, not just in Plateau State, but other parts of the Federation, uh, to keep them from having full access uh, to the benefits of citizenship. Right. So I just want to get this clear, Darren. So, so we're talking less about religion and more about uh, land and territorial rights. And, but when that conflict comes into play, the religious divide uh, makes things worse. Is, is that right or is that just too simplistic? No, I, I think that's a starting point for understanding it, is that this begins with politics, this begins with poverty, and it begins uh, with control of land. And we also have to remember desertification happening from the north in the Sahel is putting pressures on the land in addition to the growing population in, in, in Nigeria overall, which has uh, engaged religious and ethnic divisions. But this has been happening now for over 15, 20 years, and we're in an escalation cycle. So that religion and ethnicity themselves are major issues in the conflict. Michael Amar, I can see you want to come in there? Yes, I mean, it, it, it's got economic undertones. And um, on top of that is what has been described as um, predominantly Christian Berum. Um, I, I just want to emphasize the point again, actually, that it is true that the Berum are predominantly non-Muslim. It doesn't make them predominantly Christian. Um, and for all you know, a citizen of Berum um, may probably attend a funeral once every four or five years or attend a wedding once every four or five years. It doesn't mean that they go to church. 
they may not be Christians at all. So I think that make, to make them a target group, that just because they're not Muslim, uh, they have to be constituted as Christian and attacked for economic reasons is the sort of thing which the reportage needs to clarify and that the state also has to really look at it in the way that people being attacked in that way is not right. It's not necessarily a matter of Muslims versus Christians. It's basically Muslims committing atrocities under the guise of designating someone as Christian, whereas they may not necessarily be so. All right, well, there's two words we haven't mentioned, although it's appearing up on the screen now, Boko Haram. And uh, Nigerian police blame the most recent violence on tribal differences over land, but a radical Islamist group, which is Boko Haram, uh, claim responsibility for the attacks. They killed 63 Christian parishioners who were taking refuge in a preacher's house. And let's have a look at what we know about the group. Uh, it's a radical armed group based in Nigeria. It says it wants to wipe out any Western influence in the north of the country. Uh, the group also wants to create an Islamic state in the north. Uh, the recent attacks involve bombings. Their trademark has been to use gunmen on motorbikes to kill police, politicians and anyone who criticise them, criticises them. So Isaac Albert, um, if we throw Boko Haram into the mix, are they, would you say, a group that's uh, taking advantage of this situation that we've just been describing? Yes, I, I think the job crisis uh, is now a northern Nigerian crisis. Uh, the analysis of that crisis should go beyond the city of Jos. It should go beyond Plateau State. It is a problem that uh, is now... Um, uh, it's a problem now that has been politi politicized by the entire north. And therefore... Every time there is a problem in Jaws, you find people in other parts of northern Nigeria actually fighting with one of the parties. Now, the Boko Haram, the, the recent the, the latest, uh, uh, attack on Jaws took place, and Boko Haram claimed to be responsible for it. Now, you want to ask yourself, what is Boko Haram doing in Jaws? Boko Haram started in Maduguri spread to Kano, spread to Bauchi and a few other places. Now, what is Boko Haram doing in, uh, doing in Jos? Uh, now, when uh, in December 2011, when Mandela uh, in Niger State was attacked by Boko Haram, it claims to be responsible. One of its uh, reasons for that attack is that Muslims in Jos were attacked by Christians. And they threaten to take, you know, to, 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 to commit more atrocities in response to what they consider to be injustice done to Muslims in the city of Jos. OK, Isaac, uh, let's, let's just hold on a second there. I just I want to take this to broaden out a little bit. Uh, uh, Darren Q in America, just how, po how powerful uh, would you say Boko Haram are? And can they, because in theory they've already been... Uh, put down once before, but they certainly came back. Could they uh, gain more force as time goes on? Yes, I, I think they're, they have the military initiative right now, and I think they've had uh, success, I think, I would guess, far beyond that they themselves expected uh, over the last year. Uh, I would say that the movement is quite large. They've shown at least a hardline faction within Boko Haram has shown a tremendous amount of operational sophistication. The number of attacks that they've been able to carry out, uh, the level of the attacks, the, the sophistication of the weaponry that they're using, all shows a very uh, sophisticated organization, at least of the military wing of, of the movement. Uh, so, and they've been able to hit targets as far south, perhaps, as Kogi State, uh, which is in sort of south-central Nigeria. Uh, they've been as far west as Kano and even uh, further west of there. And as Professor Albert mentions, their base is in the northeast. Uh, so that's a tremendous amount of geographical area uh, that they themselves or some of their uh, allies uh, in other movements in, the, in parts of Nigeria may have been able to carry out. And how much support do you think they can gather? Is, is that momentum, is their momentum going to build, do you think? 
I think that uh, they have some support in fringe pockets of particularly disaffected parts of the population, um, young unemployed uh, men, folks uh, that are displaced from some of the other conflicts and from the Joss conflict as well. We have many people living in, uh, in internally displaced camps in these areas. So in those pockets, I think they've got some support. I think the wider population is definitely against the violence and, uh, and is not prepared to support it. Uh, but in a context where uh, the Nigerian government has not been able to deliver uh, the basic um, economic and social goods that people expect it to deliver in terms of economic growth and uh, ba basic public services and so on, uh, Boko Haram has situated itself as the main um, uh, social critic of the, of the federal government in the north. Uh, Michael Mayer, why can't Boko Haram be beaten and driven out for good? Because the security apparatus um, is a reflection of citizens in Nigeria generally. So if Boko Haram is an Islamic sect and you've got Muslims in the secure, security apparatus, when the security apparatus plans to go and attack Boko Haram, the Muslims within the apparatus will leak it to Boko Haram. Um, so, so long as you know, the security apparatus is a reflection of the general Nigerian society, it is going to be difficult for Boko Haram to be beaten for good, except that the government has to take uh, more, strateg more strategic steps to be able to get around this particular issue. So, uh, Professor Albert, over to you in Nigeria. As a Nigerian, how much blame do you think should be apportioned to the government? Well, the government should be blamed uh, on the grounds that one, the government allowed that problem to fester, to fester for too long uh, before the kind of intervention we are witnessing now. We are also blaming the government because we think that probably the appropriate measures are not being taken. Uh, the government uses, uh, depends absolutely on the use of force, and we feel that we have the opinion that probably uh, force will not actually terminate this problem as quickly as Nigerians anticipate. And also we have to recognize the fact that some of these insurgents are reacting to the general, uh, the, the high level of poverty in Nigeria. Though Boko Haram members are not the only poor people in Nigeria, but there is, a, you know, the, the rate of poverty in Nigeria is so high that, uh, uh, you know, it could be said to be one of the reasons why we have all these uh, problems. Absolutely. And Darren uh, Q, I, the, the thing is about poverty in Nigeria, it is just absolutely doesn't have to happen, does it? The place is swimming in oil dollars. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Nigeria makes on average maybe $70 billion a year in oil wealth. Um, and there's a tremendous amount of social infrastructure. Uh, so the country uh, clearly uh, should be in far better shape than it's been. And this is something that everyone knows. And it's an important part of the narrative of grievance on the ground. Um, and the inability of both the federal government and the state governments, who are very important actors in, in this regard, uh, to deliver even a, a basic amount of, uh, of social uh, welfare uh, and jobs and uh, infrastructure and so on has been a major uh, motivating factor and has also created an environment uh, of disaffection. So Can I comment also on the, the earlier point as well? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, just in terms of, of Boko Haram, I think it's important to note that the Jonathan administration has named a new national security advisor uh, who is from the north and who has made overtures to speak with the movement. And I think this is important because uh, Boko Haram is not a cohesive organization in itself. It's a much broader movement. And there have been repeated efforts from some of the moderates in the movement to try to speak with the government. Um, and that these divisions within the movement will be very important, I think, in terms of deciding whether or not Boko Haram is able to continue with its successes or whether perhaps there'll be some uh, capacity to divide folks who are just part of the, the frustrations that we were just talking about uh, that are part-timers uh, in the movement and from the hardcore who truly do uh, want to pursue the, the violent agenda and to try to isolate the violent hardcore portions of the movement uh, to bring them to justice and to uh, take the moderates and to try to bring them into the uh, political uh, mainstream. Uh, Michael Amo, do you think this is, this is a step in the right direction, that the government is going the, the right way about this? 
Well, I mean, th th there's only so much that the government can do. I mean, the, the, these steps can be taken, um, but I think the government has to be very, very strategic about it, um, as well as there has to be some program of propaganda which will make it clear that attacking anyone at all for whatever reason, whether religious or economic or political, is not on. And of course, if we look at an, a recent email sent by a spokesperson of Boko Haram that said that the government was actually supporting uh, predominantly Christian Berome, um, there has to be some propaganda machinery from the government to all citizens to, to, to sort of help educate the public as against uh, who is Boko Haram and who the enemy is. And I think that will go a long way to, to, to sort of strengthen the arm of the government in getting citizens on side um, to punch holes in the Boko Haram armory. So would you think the military is, is a fair arbiter or is it taking sides? The military can be a fair arbiter so long as they are not leaking the you know, um, intelligence information to Boko Haram to escape. Um, the military is also a fair appetite in, in the sense that they are the ones who have the capability to be able to deal with an armed group such as Boko Haram. So in a sense, you know, the, the military is a key player on behalf of citizens and of course on the state, if we put it that way. Uh, they are the ones who have the social contract between the state and the citizens to deliver the security uh, on behalf of the state. So, so it's their job to be able right. to deal with Boko Haram. Right. I, Isaac Albert, uh, it would go a long way to the government's cause and for the cause of Nigeria for, for the nation's poverty to be seriously addressed, which brings us back to the whole issue of oil and the oil dollars and the mismanagement of uh, oil revenue. Well, I think as long as the uh, oil resources of Nigeria are mismanaged by Nigerian leaders, we will continue to have different insurgent groups, you know, uh, most women, you know, as different parts of Nigeria. Uh, the focus now is on Boko Haram because Boko Haram is using religion. But, of course, we should be reminded of the fact that before Boko Haram, uh, we had OPC in the southwest. We had uh, the Niger Delta militants in the south, in the south, south. And we have Bakasi boys in the southeast. So we, we have different groups in this country that are resorting to the use of violence to express themselves against uh, the kind of uh, political recklessness that we witness around us. We make a lot of money from oil, but this money doesn't trickle down to the average uh, citizen on the street. And Nigerians are generally frustrated. All right, so and let me I just, we're just coming towards the end of the program. I'm sorry to interrupt there, but I'm just going to bring in Darren Q uh, once again. Uh, Darren, we've seen how the problems are many and various in Nigeria, and there's no way that uh, one solution could fit all the problems. Uh, but where do you find uh, your source of optimism, if there is any? Well, I think there's, there's a, a number of sources for optimism. I mean, the Nigerian people uh, writ, writ large are tremendously um, resourceful and beforced uh, beforce to be entrepreneurs. And we see the, the growth rate in uh, Nigeria over recent years uh, at least um, uh, at, at over 6 percent, um, which has been largely driven by, uh, by the private sector, um, in, particularly in southern Nigeria. Second is that civil society has been very, very active um, in trying to bridge the divide across uh, Islam and Christianity and among different ethnic groups. After the bombings in Kano, for instance, we saw Muslims and Christians coming together uh, to escort each other to churches and to mosques, and that's been continuing also uh, in other parts of the Federation. So I think the Nigerian people have been trying to take this on uh, in the best way forward. And I think outsiders uh, like the United States and Europeans and others uh, need to uh, be very careful uh, in order to uh, not take sides and to support these local efforts uh, that Nigerians themselves are taking to try to deal with the crisis. And on that note, we'll have to end it. Uh, but thanks to our guests in Boston, Darren Q, in London, Michael Amur, and in Abadan, Nigeria, Isaac Olwali Alberts. And thank you.
for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. If you want to send us your feedback, just email your thoughts to us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. Thanks for watching. From me, Nick Clark, and the team, it's goodbye.